Well, that doesn't look good. Taking a break from the Corvair to do a few things on the Volkswagen. I want to go racing in June at the Bug In. I think it's Bug In 46. So I have to address a couple of things on the Volkswagen. The first thing is that the Cobb flex fuel sensor stopped flex fuel sensoring. After going back and forth with Cobb on email, sending them data logs, there's something wrong with either the wiring harness for the flex fuel sensor or one of the components. Anyway, they're going to send out new stuff. But uh, the other thing is that fifth gear synchro stopped synchroing. It's like a dog box on fifth gear now too. As you know, the first through one through four gears are dog gears, and fifth is the stock synchro. So I gotta replace the synchro at the very least. I think I know why the synchro stopped working, but I'll find out when I get in there. But I'm gonna make this video just in case I sell it. I'm not gonna sell it yet, but just in case I sell it, somebody has a video on how to actually take this apart. I know, we always start with this, but it's really the best way to stop unplanned arc welding. Remove the rear bumper. There are three bolts on each side that use a 13 millimeter socket. This shield helps keep road dirt from fouling the air filter. Without it, the filter looks nasty after only 200 miles. Unplug the ground and taillight socket. Remove the fenders by starting with the outside bolts and work your way towards the center and don't scratch the paint. Take off the fake tailpipes, which have now been repurposed to vent the wastegate. Now you can remove the short, vibrant muffler. Off with the air filter. These two three quarter inch nuts Secure the rear apron, which comes off next. Alternator comes out next. Use a pair of slip joint pliers to gently grasp the plug. The reason the alternator has to come out is to access several plugs hidden behind it. The three plugs behind it are the boost pressure, oil pressure, and water temperature gauges. The oil pressure gauge is probably the trickiest one plug. Disconnect the spaded wire that goes to the hob switch mounted on the intake manifold. Pull the three wires you just disconnected along with the main alternator wire through the engine. Disconnect the main factory engine harness. When you reconnect it, zip tie it closed. Cut the zip ties here and unplug the connector related to the flex fuel sensor. It will come out with the engine, so pull it free. This is the flex fuel sensor mounted on top of the transmission. Unplug it. Disconnect the oil cooler lines. Have plugs and caps ready to go. I try to put off disconnecting the oil and water lines as long as possible. Remove what is known as the Kaffir bars. You only have to remove the two rear bars and the top bars. Underneath the intake charge pipe is the air temperature sensor. Unplug it. It's buried in there, but actually easy to get to. At the point where the trans meets the engine are two dash six fuel lines. Have caps and plugs ready to go. Super hard to film this part. No smoking. Again, hard to film, but these are the two water lines to the intercooler. Disconnect them at the splice section. Take off the radiator cap and drain the coolant at this location. I use factory OEM coolant and I think it takes about two and a half gallons. I suddenly have to pee. I'm gonna try a different kind of CV boot. The CVs hold up fine at this angle, but I haven't found the right boot solution yet. The boots need all of their flexibility right where it meets the CV. 
the axles don't have to come out in order to take the engine out, but they are coming out because the trans is also coming out. This is the expansion tank. It uses only one bolt to be secured. It's at the highest level of the coolant system and makes the system easier to bleed. Unplug the license plate light and pull the passenger side tail light harness through the engine. Because the starter bolts are also the engine bolts, the starter has to come out. Now is a good time to remove four of the eight engine bolts. This is the fixture I made for removing the engine. Loosen, but don't remove the frame horn bolts. Have a scissor jack ready to support the transmission. I use a car lift to lower the car onto the engine stand. It could be tough to do it without one. Once the car is lowered and the engine is resting on the stand, use the scissor jack to support the rear of the transmission. Remove the remainder of the engine bolts and then the two large frame horn bolts. If you have the scissor jack at the correct angle and the engine is not binding on the transmission, it will just slip out with a little wiggling. It takes about four or five hours to remove the engine and about twice as long to install it. When installing the engine, the order is basically reversed. The idea when putting the engine back in is to connect all of the items that are more towards the center of the operation and work your way out. Taking the trans out is easy with the engine removed. Remove the access plate off of the tunnel inside the car and first remove the shifter linkage through bolt. Then use a drift punch to pound the roll pin all the way out and just let it fall inside. Use a magnet to retrieve the roll pin. Disconnect the two gauge ground strap wire from the transmission. No need to undo the hydraulic line on the clutch slave cylinder, just remove it and set it aside. There is an additional brace on top of the transmission. I think it's called an anti-flop brace. Anyway, remove it. There are three washers under each side which give it the proper functioning clearance. Notice there is an R stamped on the back of the brace when you install in it. Remove the staging brake plug. The last two bolts to remove are the front transmission bolts. One of the reasons the trans is coming out is that I wanted to diagnose the source of where the transmission wine was coming from. This divot seems to be the culprit. Under deceleration, the trans pivots forward, causing one of the transmission bolts to have direct contact with the frame horn, transmitting the gear whine. Although the camera didn't focus very well, there were only a few tiny metal shavings on the magnet. To get to the fifth gear, only the fifth gear intermediate housing has to be removed. The cases don't have to be split. Shortly we'll see what happened. Could be the sinker wore out, but that just doesn't really make a lot of sense. I use Redline light duty shock proof oil. Because of the clay in the oil, which absorbs the shock, it's not really designed for sinkers as it's too slippery. It is, however, really good for helping the ring gear survive. This piece is called the reverse lockout and is part of the PPG gear set.
After driving the roll pin out, the fork and slider assembly can be taken off as one unit. Well, after this big nut has been removed anyway. I see broken pieces. I'm no expert, but this could be a clue. The actual synchro ring itself looks just fine. This is an actual exploded view of the broken thingy. My guess as to how it broke goes like this. The shockproof oil slows down the synchro engagement. I got impatient and forced it into fifth. The force of me trying to jam it into fifth broke the part. Let me know if you think you got another hypothesis. The broken piece is called a lever bock. The parts have been ordered and the car should be back together in a week to 10 days. That's it for now. 